Good morning. As everyone is aware, today is Palm Sunday, and we certainly want to reflect on the fact that this is the day that the Lord rode into Jerusalem, and as he had his, began his final week here on earth before uh, he gave his life at the end of the week and rose again, as you will celebrate next Sunday. We certainly are thankful for that. Some churches celebrate and remember this day and observe the Palm Sunday in different ways, uh, depending upon your church background and, and what your connection might have been. I can remember as a child going to churches where they would give all the kids palm branches on Palm Sunday, and it was a kind of, I guess, a neat thing to do back at that time. And uh, I don't think I'd ever even seen a palm tree at that time in my life. And then I had these little things sticking home. It was just kind of a neat, interesting thing to do. But of course, there's much greater significance than just the palm fronds that might be used or distributed uh, from one church to another or might be used to remember this day. Uh, as we look in the Gospels, we can see in Matthew chapter 21, the description of Christ entering into Jerusalem. I'm going to turn there and read a few of the verses. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verses let's see, 8 and 9 here. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! We read those couple of verses, and again they are reflecting uh, they are quoting from Psalm 118, the verses toward the end of that particular psalm. And I might need to mention a couple of things. We, we use the words Hosanna and Hallelujah, and we kind of almost inter-switch them sometimes, maybe in our thinking, probably because those are not typical English words that any of us use on a daily basis. You don't typically say Hallelujah, Hosanna in your conversation when you go to the post office to buy some stamps, or you're checking out at Walmart and you need to pay the lady there. You don't typically say, at least I don't, maybe you do, but I don't, use the word Hosanna or Hallelujah. The two words are different, though. Hallelujah deals with giving praise to God, and Hosanna is save, or save now, um, or the Lord saved. All, I mean, those, they're two different perspectives here. And as we look here in Matthew chapter 21, and we can see that they were saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, when they are saying, save now, Son of David, they're recognizing Christ as the Messiah. They're acknowledging him. There's a lot to this. And that's the reason why the uh, Pharisees and scribes got so upset. If you look down in verse uh, 14 and following, it says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, we just sang that song, uh, they became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself. And we look there and we can see that the Pharisees, the leaders, were very much aware of the significance. And that's why they were so ticked off um, when Jesus was accepting this welcome. And we, of course, recognize, and the disciples didn't fully understand all of what was taking place at that particular time. They understood it later on, but it was slow in coming to them. Now I'd like to turn over to John chapter 12. John also records the triumph. all four of the gospel writers record the triumphal entry. Matthew, Mark, and John all cite the Psalm 118 passage, the Hosanna. Luke has uh, different words that he uses to describe what's taking place. But in John chapter 12, verses 12 and 15, we read these words. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. I want to call attention there to that particular, even the king of Israel. There's very definitely an understanding of what they were saying, and they were well aware of what they were proclaiming and what was being said, and they certainly wanted to acknowledge um, what was taking place here. In the context, the son of David is messianic. It's acknowledging him as the promised king. Uh, we can see that. 
Now, when we talk about these verses and Jesus coming in the name of the Lord, we are aware of the fact that this is the beginning of his final week. We understand that. But I want to bridge over from that, if I could, to what we have been talking about the last couple of weeks, talking about discipleship. And that what we're looking at today, we're talking about Jesus Christ presenting himself and being accepted and acknowledged as the king, the rightful son of David, the one who was, had the authority to sit on the throne of David. And as we consider that, there was a matter of lordship. Yes, he was going to deliver the nation they thought, they anticipated at that particular time. His, God's agenda and God's plan was a little bit different from that, of course. We understand that. We realize that going, looking back. Uh, we recognize fulfillment of other prophecies that were uh, fulfilled instead. There's certainly a lot of passages in Isaiah that we can see uh, fulfilled in Christ's, uh, Christ's work on the cross. But then together with the kingship and lordship, there's the matter of discipleship. As we've looked at the last couple of weeks, the whole matter of discipleship is a matter of first the disciple, that we looked at two weeks ago, is to be like his master, his teacher. And that's certainly something that is part of our lives. It ought to be woven into how you, and view, how you view yourself as a child of God, is to be like our Lord, to become like him, to be transformed and changed. That's certainly an element of discipleship. We looked at that two weeks ago. Last week, we looked at the perspective of taking up your cross. And as one is to bear up his or her cross, that that is something that is to be done. As we see in one of the passages, it says on a daily basis. But the cross, as Jesus spoke those words, it wasn't, oh, most people would not have been aware of the fact that ultimately he was going to give his life on the cross, but it was, he was saying, you've got to be willing to take this up every day. It's a matter of dying to oneself, to one's own goals, interests, perspectives, agendas, whatever it might happen to be. It's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he said, we present ourselves as a living sacrifice before God. We don't have any rights of our own. It is a matter of God's will for our lives each day, God's will for your life each day. And it's a matter of you setting your agenda aside, of putting it on the altar, of saying, God, here is my life. I give it to you. This morning, we're going to be looking at a different passage. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 also speaks about discipleship. As I began two weeks ago, I said that there have been lots of books written about discipleship. And in the introduction that I put on the, uh, the YouTube, I, I made the observation that some of those books can actually be very helpful. However, we're, going to, we're looking specifically at Scripture as, it's, as it has to speak to the issue. The challenge I would like to bring to you this week is that a disciple must make Jesus number one. That's the title of what we're looking at today. A disciple must make Jesus number one. You have to come. You cannot be his disciple unless he is number one in your life. And as we look at these verses in uh, Luke chapter 14, as we look at these, we'll see three specifics that Jesus says. And Basically, it follows the format, unless blank, you cannot be my disciple. Unless blank, and Jesus is the one saying it. So this ought to get our attention, because Jesus is saying right here to you and to me today, unless blank, you can't be my disciple. That's pretty specific when he um, speaks in that way. So looking at Luke chapter 14, I'll be reading verses 25 uh, I'll read just a few of the verses right now. I'll read verses 25 down, through 20, down to 33 at this moment. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That really ought to get your attention because all of those relationships are the closest relationships that naturally every single one of us had. You might have not had the greatest childhood with a, a parent parental situation that wasn't wonderful, but you do, now you might have a wonderful marriage. Jesus is saying, look, you have to love, you have to 
hate your father, mother, wife, and children, and brothers and sisters. Yes, and even your own life. You cannot be my disciple. We'll come back to that and we'll talk about it more. But look at verse 37. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Just to add a little punctuation mark and exclamation point to what we looked at last week, Jesus says, unless you're willing to take up your cross, if you're not willing to carry that, you can't be my disciple. Again, a second very specific point. Jesus is speaking and he's not mincing words here. He's saying, this matters for your life, not just for those people of the first century, but for you today too, if you care to be his disciple. He said, you can't unless. So like I said, unless you blank, you cannot be my disciple. The third example comes uh, near the end of the uh, section I'm going to read today. And in between though, uh, I'm going to read this just a second. He's going to give a couple of uh, a couple of warnings saying, don't be hasty to say that you're going to be my disciple. Don't be hasty in committing yourself. This is big, and you've got to make sure you stop and weigh the cost if you want to make the claim that you want to be my disciple. He uses two examples, um, one of a person building a tower and the other of uh, a king and a prospect of war that might be coming up. He goes on then, verse 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So we see the first example here, whereby someone's actually mocked because they did not adequately consider the size, the significance of the project before they began. Verse 31, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter one coming against him with 20,000? He's outnumbered two to one. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Verse 33, so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. There's the third one right there. You cannot be my disciple if you do not give up all your own possessions. Now, I want to go ahead and speak to these three specifics that Greek Christ gives here and point out that he is speaking to make a rhetorical point in driving this home. He is speaking in each one of these examples rhetor with rhetorical technique to, to emphasize the significance. I mean, there used to be as you know, a car dealer in Syracuse that talked about how this is going to be huge. And every single commercial, every single one was always emphasized in some way that particular thing. It was a technique. It was a method. It was, it was part of their marketing that they had. And it, was, it punctuated every single one of their car ads, their commercials that they had that came on. It was, and it was always said with a certain way, too. Um, but it was for rhetorical emphasis. It was for memory. It was for reinforcement. And what we can see in the scripture, in the page of scripture, is that as Jesus, as Paul, as John, as, as they spoke, they had rhetorical purposes for how they emphasized certain things. Now, I make that comment, and I'm going to refer specifically to the first one that we looked at uh, at the beginning. In verse 26, it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, I want to point out that this does not mean that Christ is intending that you go into a relationship whereby all of a sudden within every family unit, everybody hates each other. Think with, think with me for a minute. In Romans chapter 13, verse 9, and in Matthew and a bunch of the other Gospels, uh, not a bunch, only other three, mm -hmm. but in the Gospels, we see that we, there's the reference to the fact that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, if you love your neighbor as yourself, and that's commanded in Scripture, well, about the closest neighbor you're going to have is the person living under the same roof as yourself. I mean, certainly there's the application of this in your home setting to watch out for the other person's benefit. There is talking about love. So in the home setting, certainly there's love, but that's not the only one. 
If we look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 45, it speaks about the fact we're supposed to love our enemies as well. And so it's not that Christ is saying, okay, you have to hate your family, but you love your neighbors and you love your, and you love your enemies. That's not the picture here. This is a rhetorical point that Jesus is making. He's saying, Jesus is saying, I need to be in the number one place. And those people that are closest to you, that are most naturally the ones that, in which you're going to have your affection, your relationship, that you're going to grow up with, those people that are the most normal, natural ones cannot be in the first place. Comparatively speaking, the very first role, comparatively speaking, you are to love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It is the number one position, the number one place that you need to hold is that it must be for me. And so when he speaks about the hating, your father, your mother, your children, it is comparatively speaking, as though to understand that it's not just a matter of like, Jesus is 1% more, Jesus is 2% more. You know, we talk about our elections here. Whoever gets 51% of the vote gets voted into office. Well, as we saw, that can sometimes be debated in terms of how it's going to be interpreted or worked out. But that 51% versus 49, that's all it takes, just 2%. Unfortunately, we can sometimes look at our relationship to Christ the same way. As long as he's got at least one or two percentage points more, hey, we're good. We've, we've satisfied that need. But Christ is speaking here, rhetorically here in Matthew 14, verse 26. Unless you hate your father, your mother, your wife, your child, your brothers, your sisters, unless you hate them by comparison to me, you can't be my disciple. And the point that Jesus is making is that it's not just a 1% difference, a 2% difference. It is that, comparatively speaking, your love for me has to be opposite end of the extreme from your closest relationships. Jesus is saying, I must be unquestionably number one in terms of your relationship if you're going to be my disciple. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. He is speaking here rhetorically. He's speaking here to make a point. He's saying that you must put me in the number one position if you're going to be my disciple. He uses this example here with the family. Again, it's comparative. He's not speaking literally, but he's saying you can't be my disciple. You have to consider, by the way, that this is in the context that Luke gives us of the parable of the dinner that the that is given in verses 16 down through verse 24. 24. There's just a few verses before, verse 16. Uh, in verse 16, Jesus told this parable. He said, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent out his slave to those who had been invited. Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, well, I bought a piece of land. I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. The slave came and reported them back to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out to the streets and the lanes and the city and bring in the blind, the crippled. We, we know how that works out. The point that we can see, though, when we get to verse 26 now, is that Jesus is saying, all those people have their excuses. One said, oh, I've married a wife. One said, I just bought the yoke of oxen. Someone else said uh, another excuse. that All of these gave their excuses. And Jesus says, look, you can't make excuses. If you're going to be my disciple, you've got to cut to the chase, and you have to love me comparatively so much more that your natural relationship toward others comparatively is hatred. He's saying, you can't be my disciple unless I have that first position. Well, we can see that here in, in this particular uh, qualification. Unless blank, you can't be my disciple. Going on to the next one now, in verses 26, uh, end of verse 26, uh, and then uh, 27. 
He says, uh, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We spent quite a bit more time talking about that last week. I'm not going to talk about that as much right now. But Jesus said, you have to be willing to die to self. That has to be, unless you're willing to die to self, you can't be my disciple. This is the second in this context that Luke gives us of Christ saying, this is the, this is the commitment level that you must have if you're going to be one of my disciple. You have to be willing to do that, to take up your cross daily. Then going down to the third, verse 33. In <clears throat> verse 33, he says, <clears throat> So then, none of you uh, can be my disciple <clears throat> who does not give up all of his possessions. And in verse 33, he's talking about all those possessions. Now, we can see in the pages of Acts that as different believers had needs that some people sold their property, they brought it in, and so that it would meet the needs of those that had, that had needs, that had shortages. Uh, we can see that Ananias and Sapphira thought that they were going to get a pat on the back because of how they presented their particular gift. Although there's a lot of problems, of course, we know that with Ananias and Sapphira, but we can see there as we look that not all the believers sold and gave everything that they did but there has to be a willingness that your possessions take second, play second fiddle. There has to be a recognition that whatever it is that you have, that that's nothing more, as we talked about a number of weeks ago, but a stewardship from God. God has given you to be a steward over whatever those possessions and talents or anything that you and I might have, it's a stewardship from God. It's to be used for his glory, it's to be used as he directs and as according to what will accomplish his purpose. And as we, have the, as we can, we are to use it accordingly. Christ says, you can't be my disciple unless you do not give up all his own possessions. The interesting word is all. In other words, there's nothing held back here. That it's like, okay, everything is his. This is the perspective. He's saying, if you're going to be my disciple, you can't have something else. Just think of the example. The guy said, I just bought two yoke of oxen. I bought the, I bought the was it five yoke of oxen? I bought the five yoke of oxen, verse 19. And Jesus said, that doesn't cut it. If you're going to be my disciple, you can't have material things that are going to stand between you and your service for me. Christ is saying here, there are some criteria that are necessary. Unless blank, you cannot be my disciple. The next thing that we can see are the ex examples he gives of counting the cost. Don't lightly decide to follow me, is what he's saying in these two examples. Don't just rush to a decision. Don't say, oh, yeah, I think that's a good idea, and just sort of on a whim decide, ah, I'm going to go follow Jesus. No, he says, count the cost. Look at it carefully. He used the example of a person building a tower. Now, you and I don't... Whoops. How about that? I feel like I'm going fishing just to find my microphone thing here and put it back. There we go. Hopefully that won't fall off again. He used the example of a person uh, building a tower. We don't typically build towers. We don't have the need to it. The type of tower that's mentioned here is a kind of a, a watchtower. And if you had uh, land holdings, and if you had a, an, a vineyards or all of whatever, whatever your land holdings might be, this tower is a tower that a person could watch out for, both for whether it be wild animals or whether it happens to be uh, thieves or whatever it is. It was something that was built. Notice that this is something that's not just a bunch of sticks thrown together. You know, I can think of back to Boy Scout days where we had towers that we could build by lashing poles together. You learn all the different knots and all the different ways of putting those things together and reinforcing and bracing them. And you can build a tower and you could have a signal tower and guy could stand up there and it's basically a bunch of like pole logs that are lashed together. That's not what this is. This is, starts off with the foundation, verse 29. When he's laid the foundation, is not able to finish it. This is something that's much more substantive than just a bunch of sticks thrown together. And the point is that this is a significant project and Jesus is saying, you don't start a significant project without carefully considering what is necessary for it. As far as the cost, as far as who it is that's going to be doing the work, you don't do that unless you carefully count the cost and plan ahead. I don't know about the rest of you, but there are sometimes houses that you see around town 
that were bought on speculation or investment or who knows what it was, or maybe someone was going to live in it while they worked on it, and you know it, it like never gets done. It's like it's, you know where that, I can start, I'm thinking of a house right now um, that I wonder, I think it's been under construction for at least 15 of the 20 years I've lived here in Cortland. Uh, and when I used to live in, in Cambridge, when I was a kid growing up, there was someone that was redoing a house and it was like, all, it was like never finished. It was just always just halfway. Sadly, I think some of my own houses sometimes like that, different projects. It's not that I can't finish, it's that I don't get the time to go back and finish what it, what it is I'm, I've started. And to, and to be a little bit gracious with some of the other people, they might be in the same situation too. But the point that Christ is making here is that you don't enter into something significant without carefully counting the cost ahead of time. Whether it be a tower, or then he uses the example of the king. And the fact that here he's outnumbered two to one, he realizes this, he's already on his way for this encounter. It's going to be in a battlefield, there's going to be a battle that's coming. And his scouts or his diplomacy or whoever his information sources have been have pointed out, do you realize that they have like twice as much as you do? I mean, they are much, much better. They're much, much better place. Now, if you read and study anything about warfare, you'll realize that doesn't automatically mean that you should just throw it in the towel or you should look for trying to get terms of peace. If you have a strategic advantage, if you have some other things, if you have reasons why you know the land better, you can trap, you can capture, there's reasons why you still might be successful. And that's the reason why the point is made here. He does not first consider whether he is strong enough with a 10 to encounter one coming against him with 20. It's not automatically, but he says you've got to carefully consider all the different factors. I'm not a Civil War buff. I know some people that are, and they read about the different Civil War battles, and they look at the different techniques, that whether it be General Lee or whether it be Grant or whoever it was, and they look at what were some of the things that they were looking at as they entered into a certain battle as far as positioning and resources and all that. They were carefully considering how can they come out successfully. You want to be successful at the end. And as far as this king is concerned, if he could get terms of peace because he doesn't think he can be successful in, in beating them, it's better off that they not destroy his whole country, even if they have to pay tribute in some way. And they, they have to pay. It's going to be costly, but at least they don't destroy the whole country. And that's what he's considering. What are the consequences here? And... Jesus is saying, you've got to count the cost. You've got to consider it carefully ahead of time. So a military engagement, a major thing like that, Christ is saying, that's an example of counting the cost for following me. Are you going to be my disciple? You consider the cost carefully. And then the last passage, which I haven't read yet, is verses 34 and 35. And this, in these verses... The point that Jesus is making is that a disciple is to be useful to his master. And he used the example of salt. Verse 34, therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pit. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Think about those last words. It's as though, you know, you're talking to someone and you don't think they're paying attention and you know it's important and you say, listen to me. This is for your good. I'm not saying this for my health. Listen to me. You need to know this. And their mind is sort of, you know, sort of looking all around. They're sort of airheaded or whatever it is. You, you can see, you can tell that they're not. It's not registering. Jesus is saying here at the end, he who has ears to hear let him hear. This is important what I'm saying. Now, as far as the salt and what it's used for, we, of course, use salt in two principal ways, either for seasoning or for preservative. And obviously, it was used that way back at that time. However, they had other uses for the salt as well. And Jesus is alluding to some of those even here. One of the things that I read was done is that salt, when I use salt here, by the way, it's to get rid of the weeds. 
and that we have weeds that like to grow between the crack, between the front step of the church and the threshold. And if I have some salty water, if I have vinegar from cleaning the coffee pot, they go right there on those weeds, right along there. I figure that's a good natural way to get rid of them. If the vinegar doesn't, the hot water, if the salt doesn't get them. And it's amazing, those weeds are resilient. Nothing seems to kill them. They still come back again. Um, however, from what I've read, salt can be used in a different way as it was back then, in that it, it said that it, sometimes salt would be used on the soil because it would kill the surface weeds, but actually have benefit long-term as far as the soil. Obviously not too much, but it could have benefit long-term with the soil. And I'm not an agronomist. I'm not, I'm not a soil scientist, so I can't explain that. I don't know. But that's apparently one of the understandings that they had. The point is that if the salt has lost its, its saltiness, it's not even good for that. Uh, it also could be used with manure pot. I couldn't figure that one out. And it said that it slows the rate of decomposition. So you preserve the fertilizer benefit of the manure pile longer because the salt slows down its rate of breaking down. That was interesting. I, I didn't know that. Again, I'm not a scientist. And if you can tell me that I'm all wrong, well, that's the commentary I read was all wrong. I, that's, I'm just sharing with you because I had no idea what the background was for that. It's certainly not how we would use salt today. One thing that is very significant is that while we have ready, clean sources of salt, it's usually sold in blue tubes um, in our grocery stores, and it's all clean and white. Their sources of salt in that day were primarily from the Dead Sea and from where the salt would be evaporated um, there on the shores of the Dead Sea. There were a number of different impurities that would also be in there. There are a lot of different minerals, high mineral content in, in the Dead Sea. And so there could be salt formations that had more impurities than actually the, the salt that was used for the saltiness. It could be dissolved by rain as well. So you could end up with what you thought was salt, but actually it's mostly impurities. It's not useful for anything. And that's the point that Jesus is making. Salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is good for nothing, basically, but it be thrown out. And Jesus' point here is that a disciple must be useful for the master. There's usefulness. This comes right in the end of what he's talking about with regard to discipling and following him. And then he says, if you have ears to hear, listen. So I would call your attention today then to these three different parts of the text. Number one, unless you meet these criteria, you cannot be my disciple. Number two, don't take lightly the decision to follow him. And number three, a disciple is to be useful to his master. Now, as I bring this to a close here this morning, I would do so in the context of considering the triumphal entry of Jesus. And that as we look at all of the accounts in any of the Gospels, with Jesus is going, when Jesus is going into Jerusalem, we find that there are masses of people, primarily pilgrims from Galilee, that are shouting, Hosanna, save us. Son of David, the king, the one that's rightfully on the throne. You are the king, you are the Lord. And the Pharisees and the scribes are getting nervous and uncomfortable, thinking, no, this is not right, you can't be that. And they realize exactly what the crowd is saying. What we see over the course of the week, though, is that by the end of the week, Christ is not embraced as the Messiah but he is crucified. The challenge that I would have for us to consider is, as we would consider Christ as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as your Lord, as you'd consider that, is he number one in your life? In this whole passage, Jesus is basically saying, unless I am number one in your life, you can't be my disciple. Number one, in terms of family relationships. Number two, in terms of business and other material things that might be out there. Number three, in terms of even your own self, of being willing to take up your cross and die for me. I must be number one. Or, you can't be my disciple. And you better count the cost carefully if you're going to make that commitment. 
This is not something to be entered lightly. But think about this. Think about the usefulness of being his disciple. There's promise here. There is great blessing. You think about some of the other parables, about the treasure that's found in the, in the field, and someone said it's worth selling all to go for the sake of that treasure. It's worth selling all. The cost, the benefit here, are both to be weighed carefully. But to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot invest your life in any more worthwhile investment or direction than to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, it's costly. I must be number one. But you cannot outbeat it. We look for the best investments. We look for the best bank. We look for the bank that's going to give us a half a percent interest as opposed to a quarter percent interest. I mean, unfortunately, that's the interest rates these days. But we look for the best return or for an uh, for some other kind of a CD or whatever it might happen to be. You can't find a better investment than being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ with your life. Think about that in terms of eternity. And I would challenge you to determine, weigh carefully the cost, but decide, I want to be his disciple. I will be his disciple. I understand the cost. I want him to be number one in my life. Number one before all relations, relationships. Number one before, before all material things. Number one before even myself. I'll count the cost. I want to be his disciple. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we would consider the high cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that you will direct each heart here today, each of our hearts, whatever, whoever's paying attention, and Father, may we weigh carefully and not enter it lightly, but may we determine that we want to be Christ's disciple. Meaning, first of all, we must become like him, as we looked at a couple weeks ago. Meaning, secondly, that we must be willing to take up our cross daily, dying to self. And thirdly, it means that he is number one in all aspects of our lives. Lord, I pray that you'll burden each of our hearts and that we will say, yes, Lord, that's the kind of disciple I want to be. And Father, I pray for each one that would so make that choice and decision, Lord, that you would bless, guide, and direct each one, that he or she might be useful salt that, is, that accomplishes your purpose. Lord, you direct our steps in different directions. We go in different ways. We have different paths of life that we pursue each week. But Lord, for each one, for wherever you would direct his or her path, may each one be faithful and be useful salt and light in the places you direct his or her steps. May we all keep our eyes fixed on the Savior. May we keep our eyes fixed on the one who was riding there into Jerusalem, the one to whom we say, Lord, save us, and also the one that's the son of David, the king, the Lord. May you have that place in each of our lives, I pray, for your glory. May our lives be conformed and changed, and may we become changed to become like him. And may you be glorified in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.